Alleluia! Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia! Let's pray. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life, grant that we, who celebrate with joy the day of the Lord's resurrection, may by your life-giving Spirit be delivered from sin and raised from death. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you, No secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in his presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. We pray for the forgiveness of our sins. Let's pray together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Amen. And let's reaffirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen to the word of God. Picture this scene. A man stood at a metro station in Washington, D.C. and started to play the violin. It was a cold January morning. He played six classical pieces for about 45 minutes. During that time, since it was rush hour, it was calculated that thousands of people went through the station, most of them on their way to work. Three minutes went by and a middle-aged man noticed there was a musician playing. He slowed his pace and stopped for a few seconds, then hurried up to meet his schedule. A minute later, the violinist received his first dollar tip. A woman threw the money into his open violin case and without stopping continued to walk. A few minutes later, someone leaned against the wall to listen to him. But the man looked at his watch and started to walk again. Clearly, he was late for work. In the 45 minutes the musician played, only six people stopped and stayed for a while. About 20 gave him money, but continued to walk their normal pace. He collected $32. When he finished playing and silence took over, few noticed. No one applauded, not much recognition. No one knew this, but the violinist was Joshua Bell, one of the best musicians in the entire world. He played one of the most intricate pieces ever written with his prized Stradivarius violin worth $3.5 million. Two days before his playing in the subway, Joshua Bell sold out a theater in Boston with seats averaging over $100 apiece. This is a true story. Joshua Bell playing incognito in the metro station was organized by the Washington Post as part of a social experiment about perception, taste, and priorities of people. The outline of the experiment was, in a commonplace environment, at an inappropriate hour, do we perceive beauty? Do we stop to appreciate it? Do we recognize greatness in unexpected contexts? One of the possible conclusions from this experiment could be, if we do not have a moment to stop and listen to one of the best musicians in the world playing the best music ever written, how many other things are we missing in life? The same can be said about the Easter story. With the busyness of life and the confusion that surrounds many people concerning the good news of Jesus Christ and his powerful resurrection, are we at times like those busy commuters, rushing through life, too preoccupied with life's concerns to notice the Lord of life and the life-transforming message that Jesus brings? Today we're going to look at the story of the Apostle Peter sharing the Easter message of Jesus with a man named Cornelius and his family. Let's pray first. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be truly acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. What we have here today is a message to someone who had been on the outside of Judaism. Cornelius was a Gentile. He was, as it were, like a person who might have slowed down for a moment to listen to the beautiful music of Joshua Bell in the train station. But will he appreciate the music and will he recognize who is playing? The Bible tells us that Cornelius respected and valued the Jewish traditions and was doing his best in life to honor the God of Israel. So Peter is saying to him, in effect, well, 
You've been standing on the outskirts, looking on with admiration. How about seeing how God has fulfilled all of Israel's dreams in sending Jesus? So, Peter preaches a sermon. To begin with, Peter tells him, God sent the message of peace through Jesus Christ. When Jesus announced the coming of the kingdom of God, he did so at a time when there was an expectation from many people that an imminent armed revolt was coming against their Roman oppressors. They were occupied people. Some people wanted to take matters into their own hands and start a bloody revolution against Rome. No, no, declared Jesus. His was a message of peace. Verse 36 tells us, As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. But to underwrite the message, to validate this incredible message, God anointed Jesus with the power of the Holy Spirit. He went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by sickness or by evil, because God was with Jesus. In other words, Jesus truly was the Messiah, the Anointed One, God in the flesh. Though, of course, his reign and his rule would not be through force, trying to overtake their political rivals, but through peace, healing, and mercy. And to prove that this was all absolutely true, God was with Jesus so much that he raised him from the dead after the cruel cross of Good Friday. And this, of course, is the central affirmation of the gospel message. It's what Easter is all about. God raised Jesus from physical death. And so, Peter rounds off his message to Cornelius, the Gentile, by saying, verse 43, to him, all the prophets, to him, that's Jesus, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. In other words, Peter is saying to Cornelius, the one that you have been worshiping from the sidelines has done all of this as part of his global plan to set everything right at last. And at every stage, Jesus is right in the middle of it all. God has fulfilled the purpose for which he has called Israel in the first place. And you, Cornelius, and anyone else who chooses to believe this message will receive an incredibly warm welcome into God's family, whose home has written in bright shining letters above the door the wonderful words, forgiven and loved forever. And of course, that offer is to you and to me as well. It's interesting to me that when Peter, Peter f finishes his sermon, Cornelius and his family don't even have a chance to say, we believe. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit of God falls upon them and they begin to speak with the gift of tongues, just as the apostles did on the day of Pentecost. Amazing. All of this is meant when it says, verse 34, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. favoritism. In other words, this offer is to open to anyone who chooses Jesus. I want to make it clear that this doesn't mean that God runs the world like some kind of big democracy or that he simply validates and accepts everyone's opinion about everything, or, it, or accepts everyone's lifestyle. It means that there is no ethnic, 
geographical, social, or moral barriers in a way of a person being offered forgiveness and new life through Jesus Christ. I believe that this is much more a powerful message than an easy going, you know, it doesn't really matter what you believe. Tolerance, which much of our contemporary society embraces now. Cornelius did not want God to tolerate him. I don't think anyone wants to be merely tolerated by God. We want to be embraced. We want to be forgiven. We want to be healed. We want to be transformed and given real purpose in life. And the Bible tells us, amazingly, that Cornelius was, and his family, totally embraced this. And so the Lord Jesus comes today. He waits in every subway, workplace, home, hospital, or heart, playing his sweet music to a world that sadly at times is too busy or preoccupied to stop and enjoy. The Easter message is simple. Jesus is raised from the dead. Therefore, everything that he said is true. Everything that he demonstrated is true. Therefore, he is the Messiah. He is the true Lord and God of the entire world. Therefore, we and anyone who chooses to believe in him have a task to do. We are to act as his heralds, announcing by the way we live, what we share, the Lordship of Jesus Christ to, to the entire world. It's not Jesus is raised, therefore spend the rest of your life, you know, looking up into the sky, keep looking, because one day you'll be going there too. Too many preachers have tried to pull the Easter gospel in that direction. But the main line of thought within the gospel themselves is this. Jesus is raised from the dead. Therefore, God's new creation has started. And therefore, you and me and anyone else are all invited to be not only beneficiaries of the new creation, but actual participants who have an incredibly important role to play right now to make it happen. And I believe that's what Jesus meant when he prayed, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So on this Easter Sunday, we glory in the fact that Jesus is in fact alive. He is risen from the dead. He has given us the Holy Spirit to those who believe in him. And he has filled us with new purpose and new life. So let's pray right now, thanking the Lord for that incredible truth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for my friends gathered today. We thank you for the incredible message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he lived, he died a cruel death on a cross, and he was raised to new life by God himself. Father, I pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit of those who are listening right now. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray. Bless each person. Lord, fill us again with a wonder that you love us, have embraced us, forgiven us through the risen Lord, Jesus Christ. We pray all of these things, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless your Easter. Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And praying together, Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.